Well, hello again, Connecting Point Church. And um, today we start our study uh, through the book of Revelation. And uh, so to get us started, um, I want you to immediately go to a table talk, and at least think about this if you're watching on video. And the question is, have you read the book of Revelation? If so, what stands out to you from your reading? And if not, why not? And do you hope to read it at some time? I'll give you a few minutes to think about that, then we'll come back and get started. All right, just before we get going on this, I just want to um, let you know that at the very end of this video, so after, you know, the, the graphic that comes up that says Connecting Point Church and there's the music, right after that, uh, there's going to be a slide up here that has um, the names of some titles of books and the authors who wrote them, just as, um, you know, just as a resource in case you're looking for material and obviously some of the material that I'll be talking about today is referenced in some of those works. Um, so I just thought I'd put that up for, um, for your information. Okay, so let's get right into this. Before we start diving into the text of Revelation chapter 1, which we will get to uh, in, in just a little bit, I thought it'd be important uh, to look at some of the concepts that have shaped the interpretation of Revelation, particularly in our North American context. Where do our ideas come from about, you know, things in the book of Revelation? And so I want to lay out some of the um, theological or, or and hermeneutical presuppositions and, and how people have approached this book so that you can kind of get a, an idea of, of the landscape of, of where ideas come from and where your, some of your ideas may have come from without really knowing where they've come from. So first of all, I want to look at um, a few different presuppositions and then we'll make some uh, more uh, detailed comments on on some of them, but not all of them. But uh, some of these hermeneutical presuppositions or theological presuppositions include the following views. There's the preterists, where this view interprets revelation historically. It holds that what John prophesied took place in the first century, soon after uh, his writing of the book. We're going to come back to the, to the Preterists and have a deeper dive into that in a minute. Then there's the Historicists, where Revelation is the story of church history or man's history through the eyes of the church until the end of time. The events of Revelation become evident in the course of history. We're not going to comment on this one later on. Um, it's probably just not worth our time. Uh, there's not many people who hold this. It was a, a view held more during the Reformation. And uh, so we don't really need to get into that. But the views that are most prevalent, other than the Preterist view in our time, are what there's called the Futurist views. And we're going to look at two different models of that. One is the Futurist's who uh, come under the title of dispensation, dispensationalism. Um, just briefly, rev in, in the view of the dispensationalist, Revelation is nearly entirely about literal future events. It sees the events of Revelation as the next in a series of dispensations or eras that have not yet taken place, that has not yet taken place. Um, then there's a modification of the futurist view. And so I'm going to call it the modified view. And this view employs, and this is important to understand, this view employs an already not yet approach to understanding the events of Revelation. This is based on the idea that the kingdom of God was ushered in by Christ through his death, resurrection, ascension, and the fulfillment of the kingdom is seen in Revelation. And so this view looks at history, it looks at the story of the church, it looks at the, you know, the, the, the coming events in time, 
and it recognizes kind of partial fulfillment of some things uh, and we anticipate um, the uh, complete fulfillment of events. We're going to we'll deep uh, get into this one a little more in a bit. The, the last one that I want to mention is the idealists. And this is uh, the idealists uh, use a symbolic or spiritual interpretation. Um, which doesn't, and they do not see the events of Revelation as literal events. Basically, takes the the position that that Revelation uses timeless images to communicate timeless truths about God's nations and states and God's plan for the world. Um, it doesn't really read Revelation as predictive at all. But most of the above views, not all of them, are connected in some way to their view of the thousand-year reign or the millennium found in Revelation 20. Now the issue of the millennium or issues of the millennium have proved to be a point of intense discussion and often division amongst Christians. So I just want to make a brief comment um, this is probably one of the most contentious pieces about, uh, you know, interpreting prophetic and ap um, apocalyptic writing, and that is their view of the millennium. So there's different, and we'll look at this in a second, but there's post-millennial views, there's pre-millennial views, uh, there's even amillennial, meaning there's no millennium. Um, and oftentimes... Christians, for whatever reason, have really uh, drawn a line in the sand when it comes to, you know, unity amongst Christians on these views. So my thought about that is this is not worth dividing over. Uh, I, I would just say at this point, I have my kind of views on, on this um, that I lean into, but you know, when it comes to these things, I kind of hold it pretty lightly. And uh, could I be convinced to be changed? Well, maybe. Um, but I, these are things that you kind of hold lightly because there's, you know, we're in a minute we're going to look at some views. And, and all these views have some pretty good arguments for, and they also have some weaknesses in their arguments. And so I think it's important to understand these. Why? Because... According to your view, that's how you approach the book of Revelation hermeneutically. And so you kind of have to have an understanding of how different schools of thought have treated the book and where your ideas come from. But at the same time, you know, if I'm a premillennial or a postmillennial or an amillennial or a whatever, I'm not going to divide over that with a brother and sister in Christ. And because it's just, quite frankly, not worth dividing over. Uh, at the same time, it is, you know, important to understand it. So I'm going to look more closely at a few of these views, um, and then we'll eventually get to the first eight verses of Revelation chapter 1. So the first one we're going to look at is the preterist view. Now, when I'm looking at the preterist view, I'm looking at the preterist who is a believer in Jesus and a brother or sister in Christ. And because they believe in Christ, they believe in the death and the resurrection. And I'll say right from the top, whether we're talking about preterist views or futurist views, or what, you know, most of these, everybody seems to land at the same place. And that is that the Lamb of God who died for the sins of the world and took all sin on himself for our salvation is now the King and we will be forever with the King, the, our Lord of Lords. Everybody kind of lands there. They just intellectually and or, or through their thoughts on this have different ways of arriving there. The preterist view is interesting. Um, now, I, I talked about how it's related to the millennium or the 1,000 year reign from Revelation 20. The preterist view, in, in this view, one, the 1,000 years is not a literal reference of 1,000 years, but a figure of speech referring to a period of time that will reach a completion or a fulfillment. In other words, a fulfilled period of time. 
Um, in their view, the thousand years began probably in 70 AD, which if you know some history, 70 AD was the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem following a period of, um, of about three and a half years of intense tribulation in Israel at the hands of the Romans. So the thousand years then in this view refers to the time between then around 70 AD and everything up to Revelation 20 verse 6. So the preterist is saying all the events we read about in Revelation up to 20 verse 6 it have taken place. So the preterist sees the events of Revelation happening to Israel in the first century. So the book then was written to bring comfort and assurance to Christians who had suffered persecution at the hands of both Rome and Judaism. So in this view, the preterist view, Christ returns at the end of the millennium. So that would make uh, preterists post millennium. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I'm sure I'm not doing justice and digging deep enough, but we're kind of doing a broad stroke approach to these things. Uh, dispensationalism, the thousand years in their view is, um, is the dispensation that has not yet taken place. Dispensationalists divide salvation history into eras of how God is involved in the world. These have commonly been presented as innocence, so creation before the fall of man, conscience after the fall of man, civil government, promise, which would be the uh, promise to Abraham, and then what happens after that, and then leading up to the Mosaic Law, and then eventually to the age of the church, or the age of grace, and now the the age that has not yet taken place is um, the, the age of the tribulation slash millennium. So the seven years of tribulation referenced in the book of Revelation and then the millennium, the thousand year reign. And so the um, some other things about the dispensational view is there is a hard distinction between Israel and the church. The church does not take the place of Israel as God's people and the promises regarding future restoration largely from the Old Testament will occur to um, national Israel. Um, the millennium, the thousand years, is a literal thousand year period. Um, Jesus returns before the start of the millennium either before or midway through or after seven years of tribulation. So there's some discussion there too about Christ's return in relation to the seven-year tribulation that is mentioned. This view attempts to look at Revelation literally, sometimes without proper recognition of the rich symbolic language, leaving a lot of room for predictive, sometimes bizarre interpretations. Um, not always. There's, you know, through the there's many that hold this view that that make a, you know, a pretty reasonable attempt at looking at the future, but it leaves room for some pretty crazy stuff um, that has, you know, been talked about in um, evangelical circles. Uh, usually, it, you know, it's in regard to uh, naming the Antichrist or something along those lines. Uh, the last view that I want to kind of dig into a little bit is, I'm going to call it the modified view. Now, the reason it's modified is because it, it, it kind of came out of the dispensational view, but trying to kind of tone it, tone things down a little bit and not have as much room for uh, kind of unbridled predictive ideas and to pay more attention to some of the rich symbolism that you will come across in the book of Revelation. 
the modified view usually takes a pre-millennial view, although they are not hard and fast as to whether or not the 1,000 year period is a literal reference or symbolic of a complete period of time. So they kind of hold that open-handed. They recognize events and personalities in history as partial fulfillment or foreshadowing of what will be described in Revelation completely. So anyway, those are, we're not covering everything, obviously, because that would, you know, take a big pile of time, and we don't really want to do that. But I wanted to just point out a few of the things that are the most common things, I think, anyway, in, in that shape, uh, the minds of evangelicals. But before we move on, I want you to go and think about this question, have this talk. What has your understanding of the what has been your understanding of the millennium and how did you acquire this understanding? So think about that and then we'll come back and we'll get more into the book of Revelation. Okay, before we start tackling any text, I want to look at um, a main theme that uh, is in the book of Revelation. And the main theme really is obvious right from the beginning. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, revealed as the Lamb who was slain, and also the Lord and King. Um, the revelation of Jesus, which is really the point of the book, and we'll see that when we uh, read the first eight verses, is prominent right through the whole book. Of Revelation because it is the revelation from and of Jesus Christ. Also throughout the book there's sort of a through most of the book there's there's a um, what you say there's an undercurrent that is taking place and, and this undercurrent is are represented by references to Babylon and they are prominent throughout the book. Babylon is used to describe or, or to identify any worldly system that opposes Christ. And the description and the fall of Babylon comes to a head in chapters 17 to 19 of the Revelation. Um, but as we, re as we go through the book and we see references or there's inferences to this, we'll identify those as we go. All of this is leading to the anticipated ultimate victory of Christ over sin and death and the fulfillment of the kingdom of God and putting to rest the power of Babylon. So when we read Revelation, we read with the goal of being conformed to the will and purpose of Christ. And even though we live in Babylon, we learn to discern the corruption of the world and at the end be identified with the Lamb of God who delivered us from our sin. Uh, Scott McKnight, in his book Revelation for the Rest of Us, he writes this, The book of Revelation, when read well, forms us into dissident disciples who discern corruptions in the world and the church. Conformity to the world is the problem. Discipleship requires dissidence when one lives in Babylon. And, and McKnight goes on really to make a case that the purpose of the book of Revelation is to make us into disciples who are radically committed to the Lamb of God who died for our sins and now is Lord of Lords. To be radically committed, which means being very discerning about evil, being very discerning about Babylon, Babylon being the system that opposes Christ. And so really, the book of Revelation revealing Christ to us is forming us into people who are um, 
very clear, very critical, and sensitive to the forces of evil in the world. And, and this being um, motivating us to be more committed, our lives more conformed to the Lamb who was slain. So with, with that kind of in mind as a background theme, that it's about Christ, it's about forming in us, um, forming us as dis discerning disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, with that kind of as a general idea going into this book, I think that is a good principle for helping us to kind of work our way through all the content um, knowing that it is shaping us and really is the way this book shapes us is part of uh, the blessing of, of reading and hearing the book of Revelation. Um, okay, so with that in mind, we'll continue. Now what I want you to do is keep in mind this concept that Scott McKnight um, identified, when really it's where the only time I've ever seen this, is this idea of a dissident disciple. A disciple so committed to Christ that he's always at odds with the, the world system. So, because we're going to come at the very end, we're going to come back to that idea of a dissident disciple. Right now, let's go to Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to look uh, at the first eight verses. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. The first two verses give us the whole purpose and scope of what John is writing. The revelation from Jesus Christ. The, the very first phrase of the book, the revelation from Jesus Christ, kind of sets the tone, gives us the parameters of the book. And it's, um, it's what God was showing that because of what was soon to take place. Now, we won't get right into all of that right now because that means we would have to read the whole book. So just keep that in mind. And then it talks about everything John saw, which is two things, the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Those things will be dealt with as we go along in the book as well. These verses also reveal how the vision or the message was delivered. It begins with God and then goes from, it says, which God gave him, Jesus, to show his servants. So God, Jesus, who then used an angel then to deliver the message to his servant, John. So in, in a sense, this has um, come right from the throne of God down to the Isle of Patmos where John was. Verse 3 provides an instruction and blessing in relation to this. What we will discover in a moment is that the written work would be presented to seven churches in the Roman province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. And John said it was to be read aloud, and the hearers were to take it to heart. If they did this, they would be blessed. And again, I'm drawing on McKnight. And uh, in terms of what is this blessing, well, blessed with wisdom for discernment of the corruption of Babylon, blessed by being a witness of the Son of Jesus, and blessed to be able to worship at the throne of God. Three general areas of blessing, wisdom, witness, and worship. I really like that. But before we go on, I want you to think about this question. What do you think are the implications of John's instruction for the hearers to take to heart what is written. We'll be back in a moment. Okay, let's pick it up in uh, verse 4. Um, starts 
says John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Verse 4 and 5, or the, this is the first part of 5, 5a, I guess. Verse 4 and 5 is one of the greatest trin Trinitarian references in the New Testament. Let's just look at this. It says, grace and peace to you from, and it's God, described as who is, who was, and who is to come. The Holy Spirit which John uses the phrase, and from the seven spirits, the seven spirits before his throne. And this is John's language for the Holy Spirit. He also uses this in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 5, and chapter 5, verse 6. Seven being the number of God, or the perfect number of perfection. It affirms the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to come across language like this throughout the book, symbolic language of different things. And uh, this idea of the seven spirits is describing the Holy Spirit as a full member of the Godhead, the number of perfection. And then Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, or the resurrection. And then the ruler, the king um, of all the kings of the earth, we use the phrase king of kings sometimes. The rest of verse 5 and verse 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So John launches into praise in these introductory verses anticipating the scene in chapter 19 describing praise that sounded like a roar of rushing water and loud peals of thunder and why do we praise him well it's laid out here jesus loves us jesus freed us by his blood jesus made us a kingdom of priests to serve god uh, you can cross-reference first uh, peter 2 9 on that and this is why he is to be glorified forever because he loves us, he freed us, and he then made us a kingdom of priests. Then John says this in verse 7, and this is great. He says, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. So verse 7 is the message of the discerning or the dissident disciple of Jesus. Um, it's, it's like the system of Babylon, the system of the world, the system that opposes Jesus Christ, it bombards us every day. We get hit by things every day that are consistent with the sin of the world. And we have to deal with it. And John's basically saying, well, here's your comeback. Here's how you do this. You say, well, number one, he's coming back. And uh, I want you to cross-reference that with Acts 1.11. And there's some parallels there. Jesus is coming back. And not only that, everyone will know. Everyone will see him. Even those who killed him will know. And the system, all peoples, it says, the system that opposes him are going to regret it. They will regret their choices. And he says, so shall it be, or this is the way it will be. And so when we're dealing with, you know, the, the, the age we live in and the, the system of Babylon that we exist in, this is kind of our retort, our comeback. This is what we believe. This is what we say in the face of those in opposition or of the system in opposition. He's coming back. Everyone will know. Those who killed him will know. The system that opposes him are going to regret it, and that's the way it is. And then he finishes off the chapter, or this section of the chapter, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. 
uses that phrase again of who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. So all of this that he just said is based on the one who has all authority. It's like verse 8, I'm signing off, God says, on these things. Here's my signature. So I want us to finish off this opening session with this table talk. What does it mean to be a dissident disciple? And how might this influence how you understand following Jesus and take time to pray? And we'll pick it up again next week.